So hi everyone, my name is Mathieu and I'm a designer here at Adaptive Lab. I'd like to start this talk with a story. So the story is the story of a little girl called Tegan and she's, uh, she was born four months ago in the US. Unfortunately, she was born with a half a heart and one lung. So the doctors basically told her parents that she was basically doomed and there was no other way that she could survive to that. But her parents didn't want to give, to give up. So what they did is they looked online to find some articles and alternative. And quite funny, they found an article about the 15 most important surgeons in the United States, which kind of sounds like a BuzzFeed article, to be honest. <laughs> um, but they actually contacted one of the doctor, and this doctor took the case and went on solving it. Uh, he wanted actually, because the case was so complicated, he wanted at the beginning to 3D print the, the heart of Tegan and to play with it or practice the operation. Unfortunately, the 3D printer actually died. So he went actually, um, he put all the, the virtual plans into his phone and put a Google Cardboard onto his face when he was doing the operation. So he was basically alternating between Tegan's heart in the virtual world and actually Tegan's heart in the, the real world. So the operation happened a month ago in December, at the beginning of December, and now Tegan is all healthy and happy. Uh, I wouldn't start anyway this talk with a sad story. Uh, <laughs> that, would have been, that would have been quite depressing. Uh, I'm not here today to convince you that screens are actually have become an extension of ourselves. It's actually happening whether you want it or not. And when I hear about people being addicted to their screens, well, yeah, that's, that's actually true. But I don't think they're addicted to their screens. I think they're addicted to the content that's within the screen. And that seems at the moment that this is more interesting that's, than what's outside and around them. I think we've seen over the years, we started with cinema and now we are, we're heading to virtual reality. We're seeing that the screens are getting closer and closer to our faces. And I don't want to tell you what's happening next, but it's even creepier. Um, but it might be time, I think, to think about how we interact with those screens and how we kind of play around with the elements on the screen. Uh, I find it quite ironic that we spend so much, so much time actually playing with the details on the screen and so less, time, so less time about how we interact with them. We try to perfect the screen's re resolution so much to a certain extent that no one can even make the difference between what's HD and what's not HD. This is what 30 years of video games graphic evolution look like. And I doubt that the 30 more years are gonna be making a big difference, to be honest. On the other hand, that's what 30 years of video game controlling look like. Uh, and that doesn't seem quite different, to be honest. I still, still see buttons, kind of a rectangle, um, kind of shaped. And that's, for me, that's pretty much look the same. Um, so it might be worth starting to ask the question about what went wrong during those 30 years and why we're still experimenting our screens in two dimensions. So technically, we're, when we talk about immersive experiences, I find it quite funny as well because on a technical level, yes, we're immersed in the experience and the emotion of the characters, but technically we're not immersed in the sensorial point of view. And I'm sorry to be the kind of uh, party pooper, but we're technically not experiencing anything immersive at all at the moment. At the moment, our screens are very flat, no matter how much we want to bend them. And what I've heard recently is that our screens are poor uh, illusion of 2D in 3D, basically. No, the other way. 2, 3D in 2D, sorry. Is it? 3D in 2D, yes it is. Uh, so how do we make the two, the two dimension even a bit more believable? Well, I guess we're gonna have to use vision, uh, more than vision, more of the senses. So out of our five senses, when you develop immersive experience and virtual experiences, we tend to scrape smell and taste, pretty much naturally because they only happen to be um, triggered when on specific occasions. But I have a harder time to understand why we're actually lowering down touch and even sounds. And I would like to actually be able, be able to not only sense space from a visual perspective, but also from a sensorial perspective with sound and touch. And what I mean by sp spatial experience sounds a bit fuzzy at the moment, but I'm gonna give you an example. This is actually a video game uh, that is currently in beta. And this video game on um, kind of um, traditional perspective will be played with a controller. Now this video game is actually developed for VR. If we, if we do it in an immersive point of view, I think it might be worth trying to think about how we actually feel being launched into space, how we actually sense the sound around us, how we actually um, even, um, even grasp a sense of like movements and be, being able to 
basically touch the, the buttons in front of us. So, in my opinion, this game will be very interesting to be played if there was like an immersive sensorial um, experience. And it requires much more than vision to work. It requires synchronization of touch, it requires synchronization of sound as well, all working together, not one after another. Um, so you might not be convinced by that, and you might not be convinced that actually hearing and touch are important as vision. But let's imagine that you don't have vision. I'd like you to think like the 285 million people in the world were actually visually impaired. They can't access the, screens pro the screen properly because they can't see. So what they do is they sense the space around them. They try to touch things, they try to actually hear what's around, and they are, they are able to actually have a bit of uh, sense of space on a very proximate level. But it's not, that's definitely not an ideal solution, and it's definitely not something that works perfectly, but that's still something that kind of is okay. What I'm interested to do, basically, is to create the same sense of um, vision that, um, that we have for blind people in another sensorial point of view, like by using touch and sound. And that would be pretty cool for me if I can get there. Um, because our brains actually, thank you, Salman, our brains actually <laughs> <laughs> don't work as, like as we think. Our brains don't actually see anything. They don't actually hear anything. They don't actually smell anything. They receive signals. And these signals, put it as a, our brains work as a big potato head, basically. So you plug a receiver like your nose, your, your mouth, your, your eyes, and these signals, our brain, are unlabeled whenever they, wherever they come from. Uh, but it's only by learning how these signals are being, uh, are being tr triggering your brain that actually at some point you start to make sense of these signals and you start to understand what language mean and what um, these people want to, want to say when they actually talk to you. Um, this is what Daniel Kish has been able to do. So by, you may have heard the story, but Daniel Kish is a person that can click. Uh, that sounds pretty useless, but um, if you, he basically clicks and he understands how far he is from an object or how close he is from an object by just sensing the vibration of his clicks. Now, you have to know that although he's on a bike, he's actually completely blind. Um, and that, seems quite, that seemed quite impressive, but he learned this, this skill over time, and he learned this thing by just practicing over and over. And now he's even able to teach it to uh, other kids. Um, now, the reason I'm here today is not to reinvent media, neither um, computer interaction. That would be nice, but I would like to start by making our environment, our real environment, a bit more accessible. And the, the challenge I'd like to undertake for the next few months is to actually create a prototype that helps blind people to be guided within cities by using the ch just touch and sound. Now, that has already been made, and in my opinion, there aren't any perfect solution at the moment. And I don't know how it could be like, um, but I plan on figuring it out, basically. And at the moment, it's pretty open. It could be a suit with, that gives you vibration. It could be some connected clothing. Uh, it could be some wearables. It could be anything that can give you a sense of space by not only looking, but actually hearing and touching. Now, although I didn't come here to, tell you, to give you a solution, I have already, I didn't come here empty-ended, obviously. So um, <laughs> I don't know about how we will go about communicating space, but I have a small idea of how we'll capture space and translate it into a language that blind people can understand. Now, I'm going to ask a question that I'm going to answer straight away after, but do you know what has been very good at recognizing objects in the street recently? Uh, Self-driving car. Self-driving car have been very good at that. And some students at the Univers University of Cambridge have basically developed a demo called Se Segnet that translates any image into uh, patterns and segmented patterns. And to be honest with you, it actually works super well. It would be cool to actually turn self-driving car technology into something that blind people can use because why would I be restricted to cars anyway? I think it's more interesting to use it for blind, for blind people first. Uh, this is actually the street in front of Adaptive Lab and although Segnet is able to just convert one image at a time, I basically I recorded one 20 second sequence, just um, I cut all the images one by one and re uh, put them together. It was terrible. But it actually works somehow. Uh, and I think Segnet will do it in a much better way and much more HD way. But what you can see on the screen is basically Segnet being able to recognize some of the patterns like the pavement, the streets, the buildings. You can even see at the end there is a bike here very far away and you can actually see the bike um, and spot it. So 
Now, what if you could actually convert these, um, these, ca these capture of patterns in the street into something that blind people can learn and understand over time? I think that would be, that would be quite powerful. And there's a lot of opportunities in that, in that, um, in that application. And you, you, might see, like, you might say, like, well, this is kind of interesting for blind people, sure, but that doesn't really apply to me. Well, I think you should think about it because in terms of computer interaction, in terms of virtual reality, that might actually change the way we interact with elements, with the way we interact with things on the screen, the, things, uh, the way we interact with people, architecture, art, etc., etc. There's a bigger application and it's an even, even crazier application to that kind of technology by controlling robots, by controlling uh, rovers that can go into places that we can't access yet. And some of you know my admiration for space and some people were actually able to um, go into space. My end idea would be to actually go into space with the robot that I created and the technology that I use uses, basically. I don't want to go to Mars, this is actually too mainstream, but I'd like to go to <laughs> s some kind of like Europa moon um, of Jupiter's. That would be probably better. Um, so now I heard that uh, Mark Zuckerberg wants to create Jarvis, um, the um, OS of uh, Iron Man this year. Well, it's cool, good on him, but I think I would like to create this year uh, what controls the machines in Pacific Rim. I think that would be much better. Anyway, look, <laughs> look how cool it is. Um, <laughs> on, a more, on a more serious note, I think, think about the case that I just gave you at the very beginning. Think about the application that it could have for doctors, for example, when they practice operations that are as hard as what Tegan had at the beginning. I think that would be groundbreaking if, we, if people can learn that at the university, learn this new language at university or even in a childhood hedge. In childhood hedge. Um, so the, the end idea, and um, I think people look at me every time I said that, um, weirdly, the end idea is basically to create a new sense. Um, so if you're interested, uh, you can, we can do that together because I don't, I don't have like, I'm a designer, I don't have developing skills, I don't have um, computer interaction skills, I don't have neuroscience skills, although I would love to have, I don't have any astronomic skills or anything, but I'm interested in that topic. So let's do it together and let's create at first a technology that can help blind people to be guided within cities and at some point if we're good enough, maybe we can create something like this. Oh, uh, yeah, this is different. Hello. Do you know how to get out of here? I need to find my ship to get off this planet. Fuck you, shithead, fuckface, fuckhead. Okay, but do you know how to get out of here? Fuck you, shithead, fuckface. Get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> I think it's a test. Fuck you. Fuck you. Well, fuck you, little shit. Thank you very much.